Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, soluble guanonate cyclase. So in this video, we now want to continue our discussion of the um, structure of the soluble guanonate cyclase by looking at how uh, nitric oxide is actually going to interact with it. And it's going to interact effectively with a uh, heme uh, prosthetic group, which is going to be stuck off this beta-1 subunit here. So we've seen that both examples of soluble guanate cyclases have this same beta subunit used, this beta-1 subunit. And basically, uh, the beta-1 subunit has a histidine residue at position 105, which is in this HNOX uh, portion of the protein, that is capable of binding to a heme prosthetic group. So I'm going to remind you of the structure of a heme group, and then uh, what we're going to do is um, see uh, how heme groups can be uh, attached to histidines, and then we're going to see how that fits into the whole enzyme as a whole, and then uh, how nitric oxide can ox activate the enzyme. Okay, right, so we'll start with the structure of a heme group. So a heme group consists of a porphyrin ring with a ferrous iron cation at the centre of it, coordinated in the centre of the porphyrin ring. So the porphyrin ring consists of these four, um, four five-membered rings, each with a nitrogen in them. Okay, so here are these, uh, here's one of these four-membered rings. Now I'm drawing skeletal structures here. This structure that I draw is going to be semi-skeletal, semi, -skeletal, semi um, at well, semi-molecular. Um, but uh, I'm not going to draw these carbons here. So where there's a corner and I put no letter, it's just assumed, it's implicit that that is a carbon. So there's one of these rings. Then we'll have another one over here. Okay. And like so. And then another one down here. And again, that's a five-membered ring here. And then a final one over here. Okay, so there are these five-membered uh, rings, four five-membered rings, and now there's going to be links between them. So uh, in between each one of these, we have one carbon, a methylene group, effectively, linking these two together, like so. Okay, uh, so those link these uh, four five-membered rings together, and now we can see that the whole structure is now a ring, so this is going to become the porphyrin ring. To turn it into a porphyrin ring, we need to now uh, just make some final changes. So we firstly need to put in the double bonds. So we have a double bond here, okay, a double bond here, um, a double bond here, and a double bond here. Those are the double bonds in the, uh, in the connections. Uh, okay, and then we also have double bonds in the ring. So in this ring up here, which is called the first ring, we have these two double bonds like so. In this ring up here, which is the second ring, we have a double bond here and a double bond here. In this uh, third ring down here, we have just one double bond, which is down here. And then in this one again, we have two double bonds like so. Right, okay, now uh, there are um, certain groups coming off these five-membered rings. Uh, so um, heme groups, basically, are not just one chemical structure. There is not just one heme group. There are many different types of heme groups, and however you choose to spell heme group. Here's the American spelling, here's the British spelling. Um, but uh, the point is that there's not just one of these, and the reason is because there are these R groups off of these um, four rings. So off this first ring here, there is this R1 group, which can vary in what you put there, basically. And then also off here, there is a methylene, uh, well, a methyl group, sorry. So here's a methyl group, okay? Then off this second ring over here, you then have another R group, the R2 group here, and then another methyl group off here, okay? Then off this third ring down here, you have a R group here, this R3 group, and a methyl group here. And then finally off this fourth group, you then have another R group, R4, and another methyl group here. Okay, so that 
Now is the structure of the porphyrin ring complete? And you'll notice that there is not just one porphyrin ring. So that, by the way, at the moment, this is not heme yet. This is just the porphyrin ring. In order to turn the porphyrin ring into heme, what we need to do is coordinate a ferrous cation at the centre here. We'll do that in a moment. But you'll notice that already there is a huge amount of uh, scope for variation, basically. There are these four different Uns as yet unspecified R groups, R1 to R4, which can be anything you like. Uh, so at the moment, this structure is not set. You can have many different variants of this heme ring. So uh, a heme ring is not just one chemical structure. There is this scope, basically, for variation among them. Now, to turn this porphyrin ring into a heme ring, what you have to do is coordinate an iron uh, cation with a positive charge. Uh, it's a divalent cation. So basically, iron can exist in multiple ways, basically. Iron can exist as two plus cations, so where it's lost two electrons and gained a double positive charge. Uh, this sort of an iron cation is known as a ferrous cation. Okay, so iron uh, with a positive, well, a divalent positive charge is known as a ferrous cation. It's also sometimes denoted Fe with the Roman numeral 2, like so. And some people will even write it as iron and then 2, like that, in a bracket behind there. Okay, so these all denote the same thing. Finally, uh, well, also there's another type of iron cation, uh, which is the iron cation that's in the free plus straight. Uh, re well, it's got a positive, free positive charge. It's, it charges. It's a trivalent cation. And this sort of an iron cation is known as a ferric cation. So this is the ferric cation. And people will also denote this as Fe with free Roman numeral, like that. And also like Fe with free in a bracket afterwards. So these all denote the ferric cation. Now at the centre of a heme ring, you need to coordinate a ferrous cation. So an iron cation with a double uh, positive charge, a divalent uh, positive charge. Okay, now uh, the way this is um, this uh, ferrous cation is coordinated at the centre is that these two nitrogens here are going to actually form covalent bonds with it. So the iron uh, cation is going to give one electron to each of these bonds, and the nitrogen atoms are then going to give the other electron. So these are proper covalent bonds. Okay, And these, by the way, are not how this iron cation loses its pot two electrons here. It's already lost those two electrons, and now it's giving two more electrons out. Uh, well, it's not giving them away, it's sharing them in a covalent bond with, this ni with these nitrogen atoms. Okay, now, there are also bonds between these two nitrogens of these other two rings. Now, you'll notice that these two nitrogens, they already have all of their free bonds, so they can't form covalent bonds like these nitrogens could. Uh, but, they do have a lone pair of electrons here, let's say, and these lone pair of electrons will be attracted to the divalent positive charge on this iron cation here. So what can happen is you can form weak electrostatic interactions here between these lone pairs and this positive charge of the ferrous cation. Okay, and that now is the iron uh, cation, the ferrous cation, coordinated in this porphyrin ring, and that whole structure now is known as a heme group. Okay, right, at the moment, you will see that the iron cation has these four coordinate bonds, so these are known as coordinate bonds. It has four coordinate bonds with these um, nitrogen atoms that surround it in, um, in, the, um, in the porphyrin ring. Okay, now iron can actually support six coordinate bonds. It can have another one coming out of the page and another one coming up from underneath the page, basically. So, this whole structure at the moment is utterly planar. It's very much so flat, just like I've drawn it. It will exist in a plane, basically. But you can also have 
um, other species coming in from above and below and forming bonds with this iron uh, cation. And indeed, that's how we're going to um, mount this um, heme group onto, um, onto a protein. Okay, so let's take our uh, soluble guanolate, guanolate cyclase enzyme, uh, which I'll draw here. So here's our soluble guanolate cyclase. Right, so I'll draw the different bits of it again. So remember, it consists of these two subunits, this alpha subunit and this beta subunit. Uh, so here's the alpha subunit that we're starting with. Here's the catalytic domain right at the bottom here. And here is the um, beta subunit here. So the amino terminus of the beta subunit. The, um, this is the h nox domain, so the heme uh, nitric oxide oxygen binding domain. And then uh, the PAS regulatory subunit here. Okay. And then the catalytic domain down here, which will dimerize with the catalytic domain of the alpha subunit and um, form a uh, working enzyme down there. Okay. So these are the two catalytic subunits dimerized together here to make the uh, guanolate cyclase enzyme, but it's not functional yet. It's not functional until uh, the nitric oxide is going to come and activate this enzyme. So this, these are the catalytic domains down here. Catalytic domains. Okay. Now, um, we discussed that the form of the uh, soluble guanolate cyclase that is found in vascular smooth muscle is the alpha-1, beta-1. Uh, form, i.e. the alpha subunit is this alpha 1 protein and the beta subunit is this beta 1 protein. Okay, now in pink we then have these PAS regulatory subunits here, okay, which have links between one another holding the two uh, subunits together. So let's draw those links in here. Okay, so these are the PAS regulatory subunits. Regulatory subunits. Right, okay, and then the final portion, which is at the top here, uh, this was what I previously called the h Nox uh, domain, and what that stands for is the heme nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domain. So heme nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domain. Now, this h nox or heme nitric oxide oxygen binding domain on the beta-1 subunit has uh, the capability of having a, um, a heme prosthetic group stuck on the side of it. Okay, so let me just highlight this up. We'll have it in pink. Okay, so here is this h nox domain, this heme uh, nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domain. Now, basically, this... Um, beta-1 h nox subunit is going to have a histidine residue, and I will show you exactly how this works. It has a histidine residue known as history, histidine 105, which is basically going to bind to a prosthetic um, heme group here. So this is a prosthetic heme group, and the histidine is going to link with the iron or the ferrous cation at the center of this prosthetic heme group here. Right, so this is the final portion of this enzyme that's going to, and this is the portion that's going to sense the nitric oxide. So you have a prosthetic heme group linked onto the histidine uh, within the h nox domain of this protein. So let me just go over how a histidine residue links to this uh, iron cation uh, at the centre of a heme group. So let's just have a look at the structure of histidine. So the histidine amino acid, if we start off with just the normal amino acid structure, so here's the amino terminus, here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen, and uh, the carboxylic acid group, okay? And uh, the R group, in the case of histidine, is a methylene group, and then an imidazole ring sticking off it. So the imidazole ring is a five-membered ring, uh, which has two carbons at the base here, then nitrogens coming off like this, and then the, ring, the bond after which this ring is named, which is the imide bond here. So an imide bond, basically, is a double bond between a nitrogen and carbon atom. So this is an imide 
imide bond. Okay, and this overall five-membered ring here, and I'll just finish it by adding on these hydrogens here to finish the ring. Okay, this overall ring, this five-membered ring here, okay, this is an imidazole ring. So this is the imidazole ring on the side of histidine. Imidazole ring. Okay, and this is histidine amino acid. Histidine, commonly just abbreviated to HIS, so that's how I abbreviated it on this drawing of the um, the uh, soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme. Okay, right now, how can the histidine bind to a prosthetic heme group? Well, basically, this nitrogen here of the heme group has a lone pair of electrons, and that lone pair of electrons can interact basically with the iron that's at the centre of the heme group. So let me denote the heme group by this sort of square to denote the porphyrin ring. And then at the centre of the porphyrin ring, you have this iron, um, this ferrous iron cation with these coordinate bonds, two of them covalent bonds and two of them just electrostatic interactions holding this iron in there. Now, as I said, the iron, uh, well, the ferrous cation uh, is capable of forming six coordinate bonds. So it's capable of forming another bond with this nitrogen and that's coming, uh, that's perpendicular effectively to the plane in which the porphyrin ring is sitting. Okay, so that is how you get uh, this um, prosthetic heme group linked basically uh, to the hi a histidine, specifically histidine 105 uh, of uh, the HNOX or heme nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domain of uh, the beta 1 subunit of the soluble guanonate cyclase. So this is a prosthetic heme or heme, or however you want to spell heme group. Okay, and let me just sort of colour this prosthetic heme group in. Okay, so in the next video, what we'll look at is how nitric oxide can come and bind to this prosthetic heme group and how that can then activate the soluble guanonate cyclase and then we'll move on to some pharmacological tools that you can use to inhibit the soluble guanonate cyclase.